We started uh, about three years ago in, in 2011, and really we're, we're doing something that's um, being done in lots of other places in the country. We're not meant to do anything radically new, really. Um, but the idea was to, to have an organisation which could do several things at once. So reduce, reduce carbon emissions by generating or increasing the amount of renewable energy generated. Getting people's money out of the banks and into doing something good locally, giving people something that would provide them with a return for their money, the investment. So we're about investment, we're not about people donating us money. And also providing funding for organisations that uh, help people to live more sustainably. We're, Kevin's going to talk about an organisation called LESS, which has a very similar logo to ours. We licked theirs. And uh, so uh, I used to be a director of LESS, and LESS does things like, well, it's a home energy service that goes around and gives people advice about how to reduce their energy use. So it's about getting some long-term funding for that. I mean, we're quite away. We need to be a lot bigger before we can really uh, achieve that in any scale, but that's what, that's the idea. So this, three years ago, this is our plan to, to raise money through community share offers and uh, to spend that money on solar PV projects. We were initially planning to do lots of small-scale systems on community buildings and give the community organisations the building that it was on, the electricity generated for free. And the fixed rate at that time meant that that was viable because our income would just be the feed and tariff rate and the export payments. And that was sufficient for us to meet our costs and to pay a return to our members. And then in August, in, at the end of October 2011, the government, this is a case that the government's changing the goalposts. We all thought that that fixed rate was going to stay in place until the end of March 2012. 31st of October 2011, they published a consultation document saying that they were going to reduce the, the feeding tariff rate on the 12th of December to about half what it was. So this meant that all our, it was uncertain at the time as to whether that would actually happen, but we couldn't go ahead with these projects uh, with that uncertainty. So it meant the projects we had been working on weren't viable anymore, but we did in uh, the following summer, we did put the solar panels on this building and on these. So we own these solar panels and we have a lease with Lancaster Cowhousing and they buy, and under the terms of that lease, they buy the electricity from us. So we weren't able to give the electricity away for free anymore, but they're, they're, pay, they're getting away, which is cheaper than they could get from buying off the national grid. So, that's our, so we, we, we since then, oh here we go, here's our project, so we've since then done, so that's, that's the, uh, that's here, I just took a pound of the project, we've since done a small biomass, pellet biomass border at a place um, called Horton in Riddlesdale. Um, it's a women's holiday centre, they were, their heating was this coal-fired rayburn and it was breaking down and it was November and, so, so we we managed to raise twenty thousand pounds to 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 provide them with a new pellet biomass boiler, and that one, interestingly, we've done it through a shared ownership agreement, and in three years' time they can buy us out if they want. And they buy the pellets, we get the RHI payments, which depend on how much heat they heat, how much of it, to the extent to which they use it, how much heat it generates, and they use. Uh, but they're buying the pellets. And have got that risk of the pellet price increasing. There's a bit of shared risk there. And then in the end, when when our when all our income has covered all our expenditure, then the boiler will effectively be there. So they have bought it from us before then. So that's that's how that all works. And we're looking at doing a couple of wind turbines, but it's it's, it's much more difficult to do wind turbines, I think, in terms of the lead in time and all the planning regulations and everything. So this is what we've done, uh, but we have ambitions to do, to do other projects, other technologies. We'll look at any, any renewable energy technology which will give us, enable us to pay our members about a 4% return. So the main issues, do this, the most difficult thing is finding projects. 
that's so I've, I've put a lot of time into finding projects and, it, and it's not easy to find somewhere that's technically suitable where the owner is willing and wants to work with us and it's financially viable etc we'll get through planning um, tax relief constraints that's because at the moment our investors can get can get a tax relief um, EIS tax relief on their investment um, and uh, that isn't available because our income is for the freedom tower that's only available because we're a cooperative or a community organisation um, and there's other things like the RHI projects aren't currently uh, you can't get tax relief on projects that are RHI relevant Anyway, there's all sorts of very complicated rules about the tax relief issues, um, which is sort of important for us. What, what does the EIS actually mean? Enterprise Investment Scheme. Enterprise, Enterprise Investment Scheme, Scheme yeah. I couldn't remember. They regard it as double funding, I think. That's, that's right, that's because, you, so yes. Double incentive. Uh, you know, another issue for us is how, say, we want to do a project. So, solar PV projects are fairly straightforward and basically. You know, it's my time, which I only get paid if the project goes ahead and then I get paid in shares. And then it's the time for the installer. I ask the installer to give us a quote, which is basically how it works. You don't normally need planning permission. There's not a lot of other upfront costs. But doing um, a large ground mounted solar PV system or wind turbine where you've got to get through planning, there'd be a lot of upfront costs. So we've got an issue about how we find that sort of at-risk finance. Um, yeah, and it says there's the whole problem about the keep well, we've got, we've got the goalposts in terms of uh, regulations and the rates and the tax relief and how that fits in. So this is just a bit about what would be good if we have stable government policy, like on the insulation side. And I think that would be really great is if we could sell electricity generated to private households. So at the moment, if you put up a wind turbine, say, and connect it to a farm, you can sell it to the farm, but you can't sell it to the guy down the road. Or if you put a wind turbine outside a little village, you can't supply, you can only supply one fiscal metre, one sort of metre of the thing. This project here, our solar project, PV project here, works because they've got this private wire network. So all the, there's a, there's a private, it's sort of separated by a substation for the national grid. So the houses aren't supplied directly from the grid, they're supplied from this private wire network. Our solar PV at the hydro, when it's, when it's done, you'll hear more about hydro in a minute, they all feed into this private wire network and supply the mill and all the houses. So that means that more of the electricity is used on site and we can, and they pay us for it rather than their energy supplier. So what we would like is to be able to do a wind turbine by a village, for example, and sell the electricity to the, directly to the people in the village. At the moment, there's lots of rules and regulations about electricity supply, which means that we can't do that. So that would be a great, um, there are people working on, somebody called, yeah, Energy Local is a sort of project that's looking at trying to do this, sort of virtually, if you like, with smart meters or anything. Then there is more recognition about the, um, oh, I put upgrade the rural grid as well. I mean, the, that's, that's a big sort of block on renewable energy in this country, really, that the land is in the rural areas. But often the grid there is so weak that you can't really connect anything to it. And currently, the way it works is that if you want to put a wind turbine up on your farm, then you have to pay for uh, reinforcing the grid, or all of the grid to, to, to make that wind turbine work. And say your neighbour, say, say one, one farmer puts a wind turbine up and he has to pay £5,000. And then the next door neighbour part thinks, oh, I'd like to do that, so I'll apply for a grid connection to put my wind turbine up. And he might get charged £50,000 because the capacity in the local grid is already for export has already been used up. 
So we need a more planned approach and a more sort of spreading the costs out so that there's a fair way of spreading the costs. Oh yeah, and I've just put down there, Community Energy England, there's a, I've mentioned the Peer Management Venturing Scheme, which I've already weighed the leaf it's about. And so that's, uh, Community Energy England is a new uh, like trade body for community energy groups. Uh, to sort of help us over to work to help us work together and represent us to government and all that sort of stuff. So Kevin is uh, is also a director of Raw Renewables <coughs> and is the director of Portland Loom Hydro and Less. Less and somewhere in Gloucester that does that does, uh, that does solar yeah. and you're involved in setting up community energy so he knows. A little bit more about what we're operating within and what we're trying to do. Um, we actually have um, a government department deck that says, and actually given what the whole government is like, actually you know, it's probably about the best we can possibly have. Ed Davey actually has called for more than once a community energy revolution. Now, you might not notice that, it, that any revolution is happening, um, but the, the words are there. They have a whole department within DEC devoted to community energy and to making community energy happen. And those staff are actually really kind of supportive and encouraging and things like that. Um, so, at the moment, we've got, you know, we, we've got the best we could possibly have, but it's clearly still not enough. Um, because what we haven't got is all of the things that have been mentioned already, a stable policy structure and, and the, you know, a facilitative policy structure that actually enables us to do this. But what are we trying to do? What we're trying to do really is to shift from six companies selling us electricity and doing that by uh, using very large scale power plants and by fracking and, 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 and so on like that, what we're trying to do is to bring things to a much more local level, under our control, and using renewables which lend themselves much more. Um, I, was, I was at a fracking demo yesterday and, and we were thinking, well, you can't have, couldn't have community fracking even if you wanted because you're looking at many, many millions of, of pounds that you're investing, whereas you, know, you can do a solar project here for 100,000 pounds. That makes it much more possible. Um, why would you want to do it? Well, the hydro scheme that, that we're building at the moment in this village is a really good example. It's actually led by the community association in the village who a few years ago, and, and, and actually it was the chair of the local conservative association who, who proposed this. What about a source of income for the village? A very go-ahead community association, brilliant community centre, want to fund all these things, how are we going to do that? We've got a river here. This was all industry along here. There were, there were, uh, if you look at the, the front of the hydro, uh, in the hydro leaflet, you'll see that there was half a mile of mills along here, um, all powered by water initially. Um, why not let's just do what we used to do? Um, put a turbine back on the, the weir. And that's effectively what we're doing. So led, started off by the community association, Still took several years, even though there's, there's two engineers in, uh, who are my fellow directors who are effectively project managing the, the project. We had all the skills here that we needed, and yet it still took several, several years. What were the obstacles? Planning actually was a relatively easy one. Um, that's not always the case, but actually um, Hydro was looked upon pretty favourably by a council that, that, that's uh, you know, reasonably interested in these kind of things. Um, but the biggest uh, hurdles to overcome were put in place by the Environment Agency. And if anybody's ever had to deal with the Environment Agency, um, you, you might kind of understand that. Um, and it took a long time to actually shift the Environment Agency being very difficult to actually being a lot more um, facilitative and, and in favour, and that took a lot of um, media coverage, it took a lot of talking uh, and, and hard work and so on. So that was one of the biggest obstacles. But another obstacle is the, um, the re uh, which Anne has mentioned, is the reduction in feeding tariff. It kind of makes a bit more sense with solar because actually the cost of panels has come down dramatically. But the cost of building a hydro scheme is a lot in the civil engineering, which hasn't got cheaper 
if anything, it gets more expensive. So it doesn't necessarily work so well with, with, with hydro and wind. But one of the, the, the great things about the community energy scheme, and one of, one, of, one of the difficult things we have, of course, is that the, um, an atmosphere has been created where things like wind turbines and, and large-scale solar PV has been turned into something, some nightmare for, for people. You know, it's a terrible thing to have this thing on your doorstep. When actually, it's... That's largely because these things are imposed on communities, they're owned by large companies that um, are extracting all this money from, you know, the, 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 the village, the community have to live with these things, they're not getting any benefit from it, and, and they're not having any say in it. If you have a community that, like with the hydro, that owns this, and is actually going to get financial benefit, and it's actually a decision made by the community, the whole conversation shifts. And if you, if you look up on YouTube, 10 years of Scottish community energy, there's a brilliant film there where uh, they interview people from a village in Scotland that run their ferry service, they run their transport. They, 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 all of the things that they need to exist as a community are financed from their wind turbine. That is a totally different conversation and perception of, 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 of you know, having a wind turbine in, on your doorstep. They actually look at it and can, and say every time the blades go around, that's another six pence in the, in the community pot. And here, the hydro is actually going to generate uh, eventually £50,000 a year for this small community. Um, you're looking at a community of a few hundred homes, are going to have £50,000 a year to spend on the community centre to uh, improve the environment, uh, conservation, heritage, all kinds of things. Um, it's actually um, possible to generate a fair bit of money from, from these schemes. So um, once you, uh, you change the whole kind of atmosphere about these things by making it possible for communities to do this, then, then we're going to get a lot more uh, renewables. I'm just going to talk to you a bit about less, um, because we're uh, Oh, set up by Amish, yeah. Because Less is a community interest company that was, was set up a few years ago to create a more sustainable Lancaster. And in practice at the moment, it's, de it's doing mainly two things. One, it's, it's got a lot of growing food projects. And the other thing is it's got a lot of energy saving projects. So we advise people on energy saving, get funding from the big energy saving network and things like that. But one of the things that we've been able to do, and again, we, we've been hit by the fact that we wanted to have an ambitious energy saving project in Morecambe. Morecambe is one of the worst areas for fuel poverty in the country and that's part of uh, the district council that you're in at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of homes there that were, were seasonal seaside homes that need a lot of insulation and a lot of people in fuel poverty living in them. We had a very ambitious project that we were going to get energy company obligation money into to do solid wall insulation. And what happens? You've heard the government decide to change the move the goalposts and decide that actually it's far more important that people should get money back on their electricity bills, although of course that never happened, um, rather than uh, deal with uh, the poor housing stock in the country and people who feel poverty. So that project was put on hold. But once um, but we have managed to do a deal with one of the big six energy companies, because they do still have to spend some energy company obligation money, they just <coughs> can do it over a longer period of time and do lots more solid, uh, cavity wall and, and loft insulation. We have managed now to get a pot of money from one of the big six. That we, that, and, and one of the keys to this that's not been mentioned yet is that we're working very closely with all the local authorities in Lancashire. So, one of the, the ways in which we can overcome obstacles by making this happen is to involve some of the other major players. Um, by working with the local authorities and getting money from public health, because again, what's not been mentioned enough about insulation is that it's, it's very much a, fuel, uh, a public health issue as well. So public health funded a big study across the, the county, led, um, led by Les, to look at the county, look at the areas where the, the building stock was poor, look at the areas where there were fuel poverty, and then we're able to go to the energy company and say, look, give us some money. We know where we need to spend this money. We, we can get the, 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 the customers, the, the houses, because all the local authorities are on board and they know. And, and this is dealing with private landlords now and private uh, occupiers, not, not council property. And that's what we're doing at the moment. 
where actually we've actually got uh, pots of money, it's done in tons of carbon, and where we've got the, the houses and where we're, we're doing the work, basically. So it is possible for community groups to work with local authorities, to work with engine companies, to get this money together and to, to, to go out and, and spend it in places where it needs to be spent. So there are possibilities. It's, one, one of the key thing, obstacles to overcome is, okay, there's a group over here doing this, there's a group over there doing that. We all need to, to kind of learn from each other. We need to share the knowledge. We need to inspire each other. It's hard work, so we need to encourage each other as well. And that was one of the, the reasons why Community Energy England got set up. We have a, you know, an online mailing group <coughs> so that people can, who've got problems can um, you know, exchange information and things like that. So, yeah, just look bits and pieces. Do talk to me and uh, whatever. In fact, I used to be a Lancaster City Councillor, so I've, um, I've been there. And actually what they've done is that they've done it themselves. They've got this, certainly at the time, you know, they realised they had a bit of money stashed away, this is a sensible thing to put that money into. So they've done their own PV systems. Oh. Rather than, I mean, you know, we'd love to at least have moved some of them, but, you know, that hasn't worked out. So, but other pe people are leasing roofs off all sorts of things, you know, so the, the whole roof leasing thing, this is, this is where it's at. Trade churches because they're, they're, they're supposed to be. Yeah, quite, well, the other thing access. is that what we need, yes, you're right, that churches, most churches have south facing roof, but they don't use much electricity generally. They're not big electricity users all day, every day, you know, so you need something that's going to be using lots of electricity in the summer because we need somebody who's going to buy a significant proportion of the electricity generated from us. So that's where it going from we can give the electricity for free to we need somebody, we need the building to buy the electricity for us. That's where it's made the difference. Um, and there was, was another thing about the boiler. Yeah, the, I mean, we have done a biomass boiler scheme, so we're, and other people are doing biomass. We did a pellet biomass boiler. This one's wood chip in here. Um, and this is a district. This is a district heating system like the one in Bedside. I'd regard them as more complicated. Can I? And, and, and on that, there is um, one uh, large-scale uh, community heat system. Uh, Green Fox uh, Co-op in Leicestershire have. Um, they, school. They, they're trying to raise money to put three boilers in a secondary school. They only managed to raise enough money for one boiler. Um, but that is a, a, a working project that hopefully will be an example for others to do as well. So there are, there are community projects around. On, on the local authorities thing, I mean, when I started off in, in uh, instead of a, a co of years ago in, in Gloucestershire, we, we've actually got a county council on our board, um, and we found it impossible to get the county council to even talk to us. You know, you, the credibility that you have as a community group, it takes a lot of time to build up. You need to have, have projects going probably. They ended up doing a deal with a commercial company and nothing ever happened. So I've, I've actually only got, just got back to a point where we're meeting with the local authority again to, to, to try and but make it happen. But there are other local authorities that are really good. So yeah. Plymouth, yeah. they're a unitary. They've set up their own. Excellent. They've set up a community energy group effectively and have raised money. They put some of their money into it and they've raised money to uh, to do 20 schools and so on. And I think, I, yeah, something like, you know, the, the, the local party are able to, to borrow money 3%, borrow about 3%, put it into this scheme, this this uh, cooperative, and it's, uh, they're getting paid back at 4.5%. So it's, it's a good deal for them, but it's about local, it's all to do with culture of the local authority as to whether they're engaged. I'm sure. And just yesterday, I was talking to people from Manchester who are um, Manchester decided to put three hundred thousand aside to put solar PV on schools. So what this community group is going on to them and saying, well, look, actually, if you lend that money to us and, and, and we help subsidise putting solar PV on schools, you'll get a lot more solar panels or more schemes happening, a lot more people involved, and things like that. So there's definitely a conversation to be had with local authorities, and there are definitely some good examples right now of where it's working really well. 
I, can I, what I was going to say was, good, good schemes will offer us clean loft if they're doing loft installation. That's, the, that's why you need multi-agency schemes, because they realise that's a key block and you make sure that isn't a problem. Because if you have, when you have individual contractors, it all depends on, on the contractor. You don't want to make it too obvious, because people then use it as an excuse to clear their loft. But some people have a hell of a lot in, in their loft. But it, it, is, it is a very important issue. On the PV tariff, I mean, the price of solar panels has come down quite significantly. And um, the, the, the feed-in tariff is still there, and it's still viable. Yeah. If you're interested, I would suggest you get a few quotes from local contractors, and you'll, you might be pleasantly surprised about how much it would cost and the payback times, they, they look quite good. It all depends on your roof orientation, but that's the crucial thing. Um, I, at the moment, have a source of cheaper photovoltaic panels as well through the energy company, which we're selling, we're selling off because we're not in that business um, at the moment. That be, the reason um, Paul mentioned about the loads of little turbines all over the place, the main reason there is because they all managed to get planning permission. It, what it actually shows is that there was potential to create far more wind energy. But what happened was the planners blocked all the big ones. So you end up, everywhere you look, there's another little turbine whizzing about, which is, which is a bit of a crazy way of um, doing things. Um, I think co-generation of renewable energy is under <coughs> certainly. But you can actually get your solar panels to, you, you have a device connected to your solar panels, you dump the solar energy from the panels, electrical energy, that can be dumped into a storage heater, can be dumped into your water uh, cylinder if you have one, or any other thing. So you can actually use some of that energy for heating your home. I agree it's not a very large company. But I do wonder about whether there are systems I know that people have got working to power ovens where you have um, heat collectors which power, which heat oil to a high temperature, which then run um, cookers. So I think there is a possibility of having some renewable heat collector which would be going to a heat store and heating at home. But I don't think the technology is very well advanced. I think there's a big open. Big, if somebody could come up with some workable heat storage, but really the best way of doing it is to insulate your home really well, because then you just reduce and reduce how much heat you need and improve solar gain and so on. It, it makes an enormous uh, difference. Question. Um, the first one, uh, just up the road to the Lake District National Park, um, authority, I don't know if people are aware, has adopted a low carbon Lake District. Uh, target and they are trying to achieve a year on year reduction in carbon emissions for the whole national park, which is completely unique. One of the things that they're using as a mechanism for initiating conversations with rural communities there is um, they've commissioned a, and have now taken delivery of a 3D model, which is about the size of that tabletop, of a rural landscape where within that they've got every single form of renewable energy represented in model form. And they, they've discovered that this is a really useful way of getting people to just, that there's something about small scale mm -hmm. three models that people find completely fascinating. And they're taking it around to various communities and they're finding it just initiates a conversation about what's possible, what, you know, what form of renewable energy, and that might then lead to some kind of community interest. The National Park is saying that anybody can use this model and they're going to be running training schemes for people to then to use it as a facilitatory tool. So if anybody's interested in that, it's worth... I think it was some contacts. Um, I you can ask me that. I don't know how to spell it. I think it's Sam Hagen is the climate change lead for the National Park. That's a, a woman, Sam Hagen, and I can't remember how to spell her surname. If you need to phone them up, they would know, tell you. I think that's the, the big advantage of this place. Is, that's the big advantage of this place because people can mm. see it. We found once you start training contractors in the technology or installers, mm. they then talk to customers and they need to be convincing and understand the technology because a lot of installers and contractors don't understand this technology. So 
they're not going to push it, they push what they know. So that was my bit of information. My question was just in relation to what's happening with woodland management at the moment, where we've got two really significant and very serious fungal diseases affecting woodland. Large areas of larch being cut down. Um, ash dieback is now on the doorstep of Cumbria. It's in Lancashire. So that's going to have implications for wood supply. And I don't know whether that's something that means that biomass is going to have a sudden sort of you know, is it a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, I can't quite figure it out, because with Ash, they're saying, stop, pull up, stop pollarding, but I guess a lot of people are probably just going to cut down Ash anyway. I don't know, does that make any difference to the market for, for biomass? Well, Sam Hagen, H-A-G-A-N-O-N. I said, well, probably these two know best than I. I know when we were thinking about setting up biomass, you need to sort your supply at the same time, you do, you do not want to rely on wherever you're going to get it from, because it could be coming imported in a ship anyway. Um, so I don't know what other of you have got. Well, well, yeah, well, I mean, exactly. Here we get our supply from a, a sawmill in Kermit Onsdale, um, uh, it's with ship. So, yeah, the supply is very much kind of integral to, to the decision. But, I mean, I don't, I don't suppose we any of us really know how sustainable that is very long term if there's a real problem with wood. It all, presumably, if there's all the dieback happening, presumably people replant. I don't know. Well, at the moment, what's happening is. It's a glut. 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 But there's. I think, well, from my experience more in Yorkshire, the, the, there's masses of woodland that really need yes. thinning. Yeah. And they could do two things, frankly. So we've probably got quite a bit. The trouble, it's not easy getting in there and getting the wood out, finding somewhere to store it, somewhere to process it. <coughs> that isn't straightforward, but there is a resource there. But again, it's something else that needs investment. It's a whole issue, you know, it's not just about, you've got to get people who want the stuff, biomass boilers, then you've got to have people to supply it. It's that old, how do you create a complete supply and demand? It's a bit like starting the first car when there's no petrol stations, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 